Jagradev, Jam Masters. The path is very different than people think it is. Let's start at a very honest and deep level and see the real path, how to really grow. You have this thing called an ego. It's a big misnomer, like we talk about somebody being egotistical. He has a big ego. You have a big ego. You all got big egos. In fact, you're pretty much 100% ego. <laughs> it's just a realization you come to. And if you don't think that's true, then you don't know what ego is. You're not looking at it properly. It's not right understanding. What is ego? What is ego? The right way to start understanding ego is to understand you're not really 100% ego, you're 0% ego. You are the self, the Atman, the soul. You're the consciousness that dwells inside, looks out through the eyes, hears through the ears, and so on, and watches the mind do its thing and feels the heart do its thing. You are in there. You are conscious. Otherwise, you wouldn't know these things were going on. There could be all the thoughts in the whole world going on, but if you weren't conscious, you wouldn't know anything about them because you're not conscious. That's what it means to be conscious. Consciousness is the knower, the I am, the essence of your being that is aware. It's awareness. This is magic. Awareness is magic. The rest is not magic. We understand where it comes from. We understand what atoms are. We know they're made of electron neutron protons, which are made of quarks, which came from the Big Bang, and you figure out what you want. Who figures it out? Who's conscious? If you weren't aware, none of this has any meaning. That doesn't have any meaning. It's not even there. Even if it's there, it's not there <laughs> because you're not conscious of it. Consciousness is the mystery. Consciousness is the most amazing thing in the universe. Something that knows that it knows that it knows that it knows. The temple doesn't know it's here. Your body doesn't know it's there. It lets you know. Well, why do you have a nervous system? Why do you need a nervous system? Because if you don't have a nervous system, you in there doesn't get the phone call of what's going on out here. Your nervous system is your connection, your wiring connection to your senses. If you don't have senses, there's no world out here, or at least you're not connected. The consciousness is not connected, so you don't know there's a world out there. Literally, you don't know. You can't hear it, you can't see it, you can't taste it, you can't smell it, you don't feel it, nothing. It's gone, it's disappeared. I don't take the world away. I just disconnect the consciousness from the world. So you are the consciousness. It's a magical thing. They don't know anything about consciousness. They guess. Consciousness is a very complicated neural structure going on in the brain. No, it's not. The only ones who know what consciousness is, is those who went into consciousness and explored the source of consciousness. And the scientists don't do that. They don't even realize the only reason you're writing your papers and you're studying these things is because you're conscious. If you weren't conscious, you couldn't do a thing. But my mind is smart. You wouldn't even know it. If you're not conscious of your thoughts, they're not there. So consciousness is a mystery. Consciousness is the most mystical thing. See, they talk about mystical things. You're the most mystical thing there is. The fact that you know that you know that you know that you're in there is just amazing. So you receive in through the senses and you notice your mind talking, visualizing, whatever it's doing. You do do that, don't you? You come to me and you say, oh, my mind will shut up. How do you know? I'm very different than other people. If you tell me your mind doesn't shut up, I pronoun to you. Why? Because look at you. You know you're not your mind. My mind won't shut up. That's a possessive pronoun. Somebody owns the thing. My purse, my seat, my pants, my glass, my car. I'm not the car. I'm not the purse. I'm not the glass. I'm not anything. They are something I'm aware of. So I say, my, my, my mind won't shut up. That's very, very deep. Don't feel bad about it. If you say, my mind won't shut up, it means you know that you're in there and you're noticing a mind that won't shut up. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what we're going to talk about. There's nothing wrong. I've often taught, there's no such thing as a bad meditation. Well, what if I sit down there for 15 minutes and my mind won't shut up? Wonderful. You just spend 15 minutes noticing you're not your mind. You don't do that all day. <laughs> all day, whatever your mind says, you do it. Oh, go talk to her. Don't talk to her. I don't know. You just got all this junk going on in your mind. And you get all involved in it. But when you're sitting there trying to meditate, you said, well, I shouldn't be listening to this. This shouldn't be going on. What shouldn't be going on? This thing that I'm not called the mind that creates thoughts that I don't want it to do right now. Well, what do you want? I want peace. 
Oh, the mind's not peaceful? You got it. The mind is the cause of all non-peace. And so basically you understand you're in there. You are the consciousness. That's the beginning and end of all knowledge. A yogi goes deep inside, behind the mind. The mind can still be going on. Who knows? Who cares? When you go into deep, deep, deep meditation and you're not experiencing any thoughts, is it possible that they're still there? Because Ananda said the mind doesn't have to shut up to go into samadhi, into the highest yogic states. Okay, then how come ours does? Because we're listening to the thing. We're distracted by it. So you can be reading and be so involved in your reading that a dog is barking outside and you don't even know it. Or you can be distracted by the dog. So then you say, I can't read while the dog's barking. Yes, you can. You're just being distracted. Your consciousness is being distracted by the dog. Okay, he just said, I can go into the highest states of merger with God, merger with the universe, samadhi. And the mind was talking when I left. Who knows what's doing when I come back? Who cares? All right. So we get this understanding that you are the consciousness. We're going to work on to ego. That's where we're going. So your starting position is your pure consciousness. You are the self. You're the Atman. You're a very great being. You. Not your body. I don't care what it looks like. Not your mind. I don't care how smart it is. Not your heart. I don't care about some melodrama. You who's aware of these things is the greatest thing that ever was. When the Bible says man was created in the image of God, that's what it's talking about. And the great scriptures, they call you, you in there. Hi, you who knows that I just said hi to you. Not think about who's talking to me. No, no, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the one who notices that the mind is talking. They give it a name, Satchitananda. What is that? Eternal conscious ecstasy. It's an ecstasy and it's aware that it's an ecstasy and that's all it's aware of ecstasy. You're going to understand there's a river of joy that flows inside of you. Go there, find it. Get in and drown. That's what samadhi means. You didn't just experience it, you drowned in it. You became one with it, non-dual. There's all the teachings merge right there. So that's who you are. You know, the great scriptures also say the name for God, for the absolute, the infinite, the creator of all things is Satchitananda. Exact same name. Why? Man was created in the image of God. That's the image that was created. It is consciousness. So your consciousness and consciousness are the same thing. Man was created in the image of God. God is that which always was and is aware that it always was. Infinite, eternal awareness of being that is everywhere. That's it. It's just, that's it. Well, what was before God? There is no before. That's what is, always was, and always will be. That's a real God, isn't it? So there it is. But what's that got to do with me? Everything. There is only one consciousness in the universe. There's only one of this magical thing called awareness. And the divine being is aware of everything. There it is. It's aware of every single thing at all times. I used to do this exercise with some people. I want you to concentrate on your hand. Don't move it. Don't do anything. Just concentrate on your right hand. Can you? Can you feel your right hand without touching it? Okay. Concentrate on your left foot. Forget the hand. Left foot, big toe. You can kind of feel it, can't you? All right. Now concentrate on the hand and the toe and everything in between. Be aware of every single thing. You can do it, can't you? It's not even hard. Consciousness can focus down to a point or can expand to wherever you want. You're doing that with your body. You do it all the time. You drop something on your toe. It hurts. You put all your consciousness there. What happened to the hand? I'm distracted by that. You don't have to be. You can feel your whole body at once. That's what it is to be God. Instead of just feeling your body, you feel everything. Instead of focusing on just your body, your consciousness is capable of stopping focusing on your body and just expanding. I hate to go, you know, they call universal consciousness, expanded consciousness. I hate to go expanded consciousness. Because what you are, you're not expanded consciousness, you're contracted consciousness. Your consciousness is focusing on your thoughts, your heart, feelings, and emotions, and the message from your body and the world that's coming in this in front of you, aren't you? That's what you're aware of. You're not limited to that. Just like you're not limited to focusing on your toe. You can feel your whole body. You're not limited to focusing on any one of those things. Your consciousness is capable of ceasing to contract. 
So I don't like calling it expanded consciousness. It's contracted consciousness. You focused it so much on yourself that that's all you know about is yourself. That's ego. I did it quicker than I thought I would. All right? That's ego. That's the difference between merged with the oneness of your being and focusing this eternal consciousness and infinite consciousness down on this one little object called your thoughts, your emotions, your body, and what's coming in through your senses. That's your world. You did that. You did that. And we can talk why. But that's ego. Somebody once asked Yogananda, what's ego? He said, the masquerading self. In other words, the infinite, absolute, divine, eternal, where Buddha went into nirvana. That state has the ability of focusing on anything. All at the same time. Just like you're focusing on your body all at the same time. So it can be focusing on you and you and you and you and you and you. Okay? Just every single thing, every living creature, every single thing. A lizard running across the forest conscious. Its brain isn't as evolved as yours. Its body isn't as evolved as yours. But it's conscious. Otherwise, it wouldn't run away and try to catch it. Every living thing. That's what it means to be a living thing. You can define it biologically all you want. But living means there is conscious. An amoeba is conscious. How do you know? Because if you try to stick it with a little pin, it pulls away. It's conscious. But it, we don't worry about that. You know you're conscious, and you know you are distracted by your thoughts. How do I know? Try to meditate. <laughs> See, I like... I'm very different about meditation than everybody else is. I like it. It teaches you a lot, even if you can't do what they talk to you about doing. All right? Why do you have to struggle? Why do you have to go to two-week seminars and everything in order to do what? Stop watching your mind? Just stop watching the thing. Good luck. As they tell it, it's a heroin addict. Just stop taking it. It's not doing you any good. Oh, okay. You're addicted. You're addicted to your thoughts. You're addicted to watching your mind. You're addicted to your emotions. You're addicted to the stored past that you stored in there. Things from 20 years ago. Come on. It's adorable. Your consciousness is distracted by your thoughts, your emotions, your bodily messages, and the world that comes in and the effect it has on all. It's just a system. It's a system. And it's tiny. I always tell you, it's so tiny, it's embarrassing. What do you take up? You know, two feet by six feet, the most. A couple of feet by six, or five, six feet. There, that's how much space you're taking up. Well, how much space are you not taking up? The whole Earth and then all the stars and the galaxies and every, oh my God. And there's this tiny little thing and all you care about is that thing. That's ego. So don't talk to me about an egotistical person. That's just all of us are 99.9% ego, really 100%, but 99.9% ego are completely caught in it, but that person boasts more than somebody else. But you shouldn't promote yourself. What do you mean yourself? The self? God? No, that's not the self we're talking about, promoting yourself. You shouldn't promote that which you think you are, which are your thoughts, your things, and your mind is so smart, and your body's so pretty. Well, give me a break. You're not any of those things. So ego is the masquerading self. It is the consciousness having focused, pulled around itself a mask of saying, I am these thoughts, I am these emotions, I am this body, and this is what I look like. Ego is consciousness, God, self, Atman, focusing on this tiny little thing. It doesn't have to, but it does. And it is addicted to focusing on this. And then you have this whole concept about yourself. I really like the fact that psychology, which of course studies the inner part of that addiction to yourself, calls it your self-concept. They don't call it yourself. I love it. They say that's your self-concept, what you think about yourself. But what you think about yourself is obviously not yourself, it's what you think about yourself. It is what the consciousness has built a fortress in here saying, I'm the one who likes this, I'm the one who's married to this person, I'm the one who has this child, I'm the one who failed in fifth grade because I was not really good at math and I've never liked it in any sense. That's me, that's me. That's not you. Those are experiences you had. It's not you. You were you before you had the experience. You were conscious, you were in there, you were aware when you were taking your final math test in fifth grade that you were concerned about it. So now you're not the one that failed your math test. You're the one who noticed that you stored this thought. It's a thought that you failed your math test. It doesn't exist anymore in time and space. It went away. You're 30 years old. What the heck's the difference that happened in fifth grade? 
but you held it inside your mind. And so now you're focusing on it. Your consciousness is focusing on it. It's very important to understand the self-concept. It is a collection of thoughts and emotions, but we're going to stay with thoughts for now. But the emotions are tied right in as part of your psyche. It's a collection of thoughts that you did not let go of. You let go of a lot of thoughts. You imagine how many thoughts you have every day? Check it out. I want you to count them. And they just come and they go. And there's kinds of experiences you have all the time. They come and they go. I told you once, 99.9, I'm going to be very bold. I'm bold tonight. They say 99.5. 99.9% of every single thing that comes in through your senses makes it right through. Trees, you drive by cars, you drive by white lines, you drive by clouds, you drive by raindrops that fall on you. You have trillions and trillions of experiences every day. Everything that comes in through your ears, nose, taste, eyes, and touch. My God, there's a lot of things, aren't there? You don't store them all. I mean, you can bring them back. You can remember it was windy, but you don't store them. I'm the one that experiences a raindrop. You don't do that. I'm the one that drove by white lines in the road. You don't do that because it doesn't leave any impression in you because you don't need it to. You let it all go by because you don't need to define yourself as it. It doesn't leave enough of an impression to where you say, this is part of my self-concept. But if somebody says to you, did you drive by that white line down on that road over there and see how it's smeared and, and there was water... The guy died while laying the line down. It was so sad. He just looked, you know, when you fall asleep when you're writing, you You will never drive by that line without freaking out for the rest of your life. Every line will remind you somebody died. Maybe somebody died making that line. Or thank God they didn't die making that line. It looked straight. It left an impression on you and you kept it. And then your friends will say, oh, yeah, she's the one hung up on the white lines. <laughs> it's just defining your self-concept. She's the one who's hung up on what she wears. She's the one who hung up on what her hair looks like. She's the one who hung up on the way her boyfriend left her 10 years ago. You just define yourself as the experiences you had. No, you're the one who had the experience. You are not the divorcee. You're the one that wasn't married, then you were, and then the divorce happened. It all happened to you. It's the same person, isn't it? It's the same consciousness. Not the same thoughts, but it's the same consciousness. It's awareness of being, having all these experiences. That's what it means to identify yourself properly. I am the self. I am the Atman. Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahman. There was never a time I was not, never a time I will not be. I am the beginning and end of everything. Yes, that's who you are. But the trouble is you don't identify with that. You identify with your thoughts. You identify with your emotions. And you don't identify with the 99% of all your experience that went right through. You just cherry-picked. So basically, the ego is the self-concept. The ego is you're the self, but you got lost. You got lost in the object of consciousness instead of paying attention to the consciousness, the source of consciousness. And that's a big word. Even if I get you back to witness consciousness, I'm here aware of my thoughts. I'm aware of my feelings. There they are. My heart hurts. I see it. You're working with yourself. You're aware. Someday you become aware enough to where it'll dawn on you. Wait a minute. Where'd you come from? Where did you come from? You who's sitting there aware. Where did consciousness come from? What is the source of consciousness? That's when you're a great being. Even when you even ask the question, what is the source of consciousness? Because then you can work your way back. The yogi knows about consciousness. Why? One, because they know they're it. You want to know about consciousness? Meditate. Be it. You're not going to find consciousness by looking out there. Those things aren't conscious. You're going to find consciousness by looking inside because you are conscious. So it's the easiest thing to find. You want to find out what it's like to have a hand? Don't go ask somebody. <laughs> Just check it out. You understand about yours, you'll understand about everybody else's. Okay? Come back. Learn that. The source of consciousness is the divine being. The source of consciousness is the creator of the whole universe. So as you work back behind your seat of consciousness, it pulls you back in, and that's where the great masters went. That's what a perfect master means. That's what Christ means. That's what all this is, is that the individual consciousness that was focused on the mind here fell back, and then the drop of consciousness fell into the ocean of consciousness. It's all merged. That's what merger means. Yoga means union. It means union. The merger of Atman and Paramatman. You, the individual soul, with the source 
of soul. I don't even like to call it oversoul, because that makes it sound like God's there, you know, judging you. No, it's all you. But you're focusing on this. You don't have to. When it stops focusing on this, it falls back into the source of its being, and those are the knower of consciousness. So you want to know about consciousness? One, explore yourself. And second, take a great master, fully enlightened being, who's able to leave and come back at will. Give me a master who at will sits down. You're going to literally, literally could sit down or lie down either, close his eyes and be gone in 10 seconds and come back at will. And gone means merged, one with everything. That's why they're called masters. Just like Tiger Woods, a master of golf, Beethoven's a master composer. We have masters. They're very great. Understand that. That's someone who has transcended the ego. You can't do that while you're identified with the ego because then your consciousness is distracted by this thing you built in here. You don't just have a physical body. You have this psychological body that you built out of thoughts. <laughs> your physical body is built out of atoms. Your psyche, psychological body, is built out of thoughts. You held on to thoughts. You were so mean to me. That's why I got divorced. I'll never forgive you. Ever. That's a thought. It's a thought and a feeling, isn't it? It's a thought and a feeling. And you held on to it and defined it as who you are and defined your relationship with another human being as that. That's it. And it's not going to change. And don't talk to me about, I don't want to hear his name ever again. You do that, don't you? That's your ego. You forget the feeling for what ego is? It's pretty big stuff, isn't it? It's basically the false self. It's the set of thoughts that you pulled around yourself and said, this is who I am. And then you are that because you buried your consciousness into that and you don't know how to take your consciousness off. You do not know how to remove your consciousness from your ego. You don't even know this an ego. You think only this big, boisting, bragging person is an ego. No, the fact that you're not merged with God is because you're caught in your ego. Once back in the 70s, Ramdas came. We had Ramdas a couple of times here. And I remember we had lunch together, sat on the floor. And Donna was with us, and then she left. And Ramadan was intense, especially in those days. And this was early, this was probably 76, 77, something like that. He moved right up to my face. And he looked at me in the eyes. And he had really strong eyes. And he said, why are you not merged with God right now? What's holding you back? <laughs> my ego. And I'm feeling it a lot right now. <laughs> It's like, we got an ego. And if we got one, it gets embarrassed, it gets ashamed, it holds on to past experiences it didn't like, it defines itself as all the garbage that it's been through, it defines what it likes and what it doesn't like, and if it gets what it wants, it's happy, and if it doesn't get what it wants, it's disappointed, and it gets what it doesn't want, it's very upset. It's just, there it is, you got one? Okay, that's what I want to talk about. Now you know what it is, and now you know where it comes from. Basically, when the divine absolute that wants to just do a dance of creation gets a little too close, that's the fall from the garden, gets a little too close and identifies what it's looking at. What if you were playing a video game, but it's a hologram video game? They're going to make them soon. Don't touch them. Okay, like the Matrix. You got a full hologram thing and it does everything. You feel everything, right? You could get lost in there and never come back. Because you're receiving this stuff. Well, that's what happened. The consciousness of God focused a little too much on the maya, the illusion, delusion and error on this, this thing. And it then built a whole house for itself. That's what you built. Your psyche is a house that the self is living in, but it doesn't even know it's living in. It thinks it is that. It got lost. That's ego. That's the real definition of the ego. So what's it like to have an ego? You could write me an essay. It would be very long. That would be your homework. I want you to spend a day not doing anything, just watching what it's like to have an ego. You're going to get very upset. That thing is difficult to live with. Have you ever noticed that all the time it's saying something? There's Sally. I don't want to see Sally right now. Oh, no. Oh, my God. Her hair doesn't look good. No, no. She's dating someone. So I don't want to talk about what she ever talks about. That. I don't want that's your ego. All of that is your ego. That's not God. That's not universal consciousness expanded out, experiencing everything, including Sally. 
That's you with your opinions and your values and your hopes and your dreams. Okay? Ego. Watch it all day. And you're going to see ego. And that's all you're going to see. But it says nice things too, ego. I don't like her, ego. I like her a lot, ego. It's all exactly the same. There's no difference between like and dislike. Between success and failure, between hopes and dreams and not, right? They're all the psyche. They're all the things you built in there. And now the self, which is not ego, is lost completely in there to where you don't even know what I mean by the self. There are a lot of people out there, they wouldn't take this talk. Just, what is, I'm wasting my time. I need to get what I want. Why am I sitting there? Why are you wasting your time? Because someday you're going to wake up and you already have, you wouldn't be here and realize this is not so much fun. What? Well, ego. Do I just define it? And it's not so much fun. It's fun when it gets what it wants. Do you notice that if it gets what it wants, it's okay? Who's noticed that? Every one of you noticed that. Have you noticed when it gets what it doesn't want, it's not okay? Like really not okay? And that's ego. It has built this concept, not only about itself, but about everybody else. It's so funny. It's bad enough if you did it about yourself. This is what I like, what I don't like. Then you literally say everybody's supposed to be that way. And you judge everybody and everything based on this ego you built inside yourself. Now do you see how big this is? I mean, I just wanted to kind of touch space a little bit so you get an idea how big ego is. It's everything, isn't it? When I said it's 100% of your daily life and of your whole life so far, it has been until you wake up. And what happens when you wake up? You realize this is not so much fun. All day, everything has to be just the way it wants or I, I got trouble. And it better never be the way it doesn't want. And even if it isn't the way it doesn't want, it worries that someday it might be the way it doesn't want. Anybody guilty? Well, well, you're in big trouble then. Unless the world unfolds the way your ego wants it to, you suffer. Even if the world is unfolding the way you want it to, it says, uh, I can't trust this. Remember last time I trusted somebody and they hurt me so bad, I don't want to do this again. You can't win. It's the biggest party pooper that ever lived. It's a killjoy. Having an ego is a major problem. It's running your life. What if you don't do it at once? You hurt. It gives you a really hard time. You can't sleep at night. No, why'd he say that? He shouldn't have said that. What should I do about it? I don't know. I could tell somebody else. I could sue him. Right? That's ego. You better watch out. You got one. Don't you? And at some point, and that's what spirituality is, when you wake up, that is the beginning of your awakening. It's not your spiritual experiences. As you look and say, oh my God. And when you see the edges of it, you step back far and I'm like, oh my God, that thing has, I could say run my life, but I add the I, ruined my life. I think it's ruined my life. I couldn't enjoy my Christmases because I was afraid that I wouldn't get what I wanted and that my sister would get a nicer thing than I got. And when she does, I don't want to talk to her. I don't want to... Whoa, ever since you're little, isn't it? That thing's a problem. No, if you get what it wants, it makes you happy. Have fun, because you won't, <laughs> right? You're afraid to lose it, you can't get it, you'll be jealous. That's where all of your negative emotions come from. What is jealousy? Somebody else got what I wanted. Or, I want this, I'm afraid of losing it. Ego, ego, ego. What's fear of rejection? All these things, we don't need psychology. It's all just bundled right there. What is fear of rejection? I identify myself with what my face looks like. And it better not get old. And my hair better not get gray. Because I identify myself as when I was 23. That's who I am. No, you're not. You're 68. And it doesn't look the same at 68 as it does at 23. No, I don't like that. People don't like that, do they? They don't like getting old. Ego is a problem. All of that's ego. All of that is ego. It is the false identification of the self which is ecstatic beauty all the time, filled with Satchitananda. That's what's going on in there. But it's looking at this thing and identifying with it and therefore freaking out that it won't be the way it wants it to be. It just made up how it wants it to be. When you're young, I wish I was older. When you're older, I wish I was young. I tell you these hopes and dreams and wishes, this is silly. You are in a state of complete ecstasy inside. You know what it's like? You're very thirsty. You haven't had really good drink for a long time, water. And you're standing in a place, and there's rocks in front of you. And every once in a while, it looks like there's some moisture that forms, dew that forms on the rocks. 
and so you pick them up, but they're hot. They can burn you, but you just try to suck in these hot rocks, okay? And that's how you're spending your life. And you're always looking in this direction. You know what you're missing? Where did the dew come from? Well, there's an entire lake of fresh water behind you, and when the wind blows a certain way, some dew gets on the rocks. Turn around. Turn around. <laughs> You're wasting your time trying to suck some moisture off these hot rocks when the entire lake is behind you. You could just jump in and splash around and have everything you want. That's what's happening. You're trying to get some love, trying to get some joy, trying to feel good by sucking on hot rocks, using other people and situations and things. And I want to get an A and I want everyone to like me and I want them to applaud. And if anybody walks out when I'm talking, oh my God, what is it? Rejection, fear of loss, every single thing, all those psychological words are about ego. You want to live like that? Have fun, because you won't. Well, what's my choice? Turn around. Turn around. You who's looking at that is the highest that ever walked the face of the earth. Christ said the kingdom is within you. It is within you. And that's all available to you, every single one of you, every single second, but you're looking in the wrong direction. Okay, so what do you do about ego? You don't rip it out. You're not going to rip it out. That's just another ego. Now we're going to talk a few minutes left, talk deep. That's called spiritual ego. I've noticed that my ego is a problem, and I don't like having one. So I'm going to be very loving, and I want everyone to interact with me in a loving way, and I'll live in a place where nobody ever bothers me, and if they bother me, no, I, that's not how I want to live my life. Okay, what'd you just do? You just define another ego. Well, what happens if it's not the way that ego wants it? A suffer. What happens if you got yourself a nice little house in the woods and, with a dog and a cat, and the dog and the cat don't get along, and they fight with each other? Or you and, you and the significant other don't get along, and all of a sudden it's not the way you thought it was going to be? Or a neighbor builds next door and has six dogs that bark all the time. What's going to happen? Didn't match my concepts. Oh, you mean that was ego too? Yes, ego too. You don't want to do that. You don't want to just trade one off for the other. You will. You'll walk through the stairs of going up, but I want to talk to you. Well, what do you do about ego? You don't rip it away. You don't hate it. You don't throw it away. You learn to relax through it. That's the highest state. You now understand you got one. Don't be embarrassed about it. Don't be ashamed of it. It is a totally natural thing that happens when the divine force of consciousness gets a little too close in the minuscule little thing right, of your thoughts, your emotions. You don't even like when I say that, do you? Right? You're nothing. You're nothing. You're less than a, an ant, less than anything. It's just one little thing that consciousness is aware of. You don't want to hear that. You don't want to hear that. You, but you do want to hear that. Right, Ram, I think Ram says one of his last movies or books was Becoming Nobody. That's the only way you're getting out. You're not getting out by making something out of this and making it look spiritual. Why? Because it's not spiritual. The body comes and goes. The thoughts come and go. The heart comes and goes. Can you handle that? That's what we're talking about. How do you live with an ego? Because you got one. Tag, you're it. What do you do about it? You understand it. That's my new book, Living in Tethers, about. You understand it to the core of your being. Of course he's saying that. Of course she's feeling that. She's an ego. Egos have a nature. Roaches have a nature. Snakes have a nature. Saturn has a nature. The ring. Everything has its nature. Ego has its nature. In other words, in order to see that this is ego's nature, I have to step back and notice I'm not it. I'm the consciousness that is noticing the nature of ego. The nature of ego is very difficult to stomach when you look at it. Totally, and you realize, oh my God, look at this thing. It's never okay with anything. It just worries all the time and thinks all the time, and it only thinks about itself, by the way. Everything's about itself. No, I think about my children. Well, okay, I see my children. You don't think about my children, but I'm, I'm devoted to my family. You're thinking about yourself. This is your family. It's a, you're this, you're that. I love my husband with everything in the whole world. What if he leaves you for somebody else? Why did you say that? Oh, my God. I just had a heart attack. I can't even sleep now that you said Oh, I see. It's not about your husband. It's about you, isn't it? Who is willing to cut through this junk? Ego is about itself. That's what it's about. The consciousness got lost in this thing. It starts with the body. This is my body. 
Then these are my thoughts about my body. These are my experiences. It's about me, isn't it? How can it not be? It's the collection of your experiences, not the collection of your husband's experiences or your kids' experiences. You didn't have those experiences. They did, but you had your experiences. And all your values and all your views and all your hopes and your dreams and concepts and everything are about the experiences you had. So don't try to make ego sound holy. Ego is what it is. It's not unholy. It just is what it is. It's what happens when the consciousness collects the experiences that it experienced, labels them good and bad, and builds a house inside and says, that's me. So don't try to make it holy, but also don't get upset about it. It has a nature. I don't know how to talk to you about that. Everything in the universe has its nature. That's its nature. Its nature is me. I, me, mine. How often do you use the word I? How often do you use the word me? How often do you use the word mine? Check it out. Because it's a really big percentage of every word that passes through your mind or comes out of your mouth. Get away from that. It's my car. Oh my God, they scratched my car. I can't handle this. They scratched my car. What am I going to do? How many you have thoughts like that, don't you? All the time. All right. That's the ego. That's the ego. It's not right. It's not wrong. It's not good. It's not bad. It just is what it is. Like I said, living untethered, I built that thing slow. If you pay attention, you really see what's being built there. There's a whole universe, and you did this. And the only way you're going to be okay is to learn to live with the ego. How do you learn to live with the ego? You start with acceptance. Ooh, that doesn't seem like anybody else is teaching you that. You're supposed to get rid of that. It's supposed to be nice to people. You're supposed to build it nicer or make a nicer one. No, that's not deep work. That's just another thing you're doing to try and get what you want. So you get to the point where you understand, I'm in here, and I have a roommate in here, don't I? That roommate's got some serious problems. <laughs> it is a problem. The whole thing is illusion. It's saying it's me, but it's not me. It's a lie. Okay, so how do you live with it? You start with acceptance. If I just sent you home with that. All right, I sent you home now that you've seen the breadth and the scope of ego. It's everything. It's why you like your work. It's why you got married. It's why you don't like this. It's why you like that. Blah, 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 why you're happy, why you're sad, why you have moods. Every single thing is the ego. If it's not the ego, it's ecstasy. That's the only other thing that's in there is you. Consciousness staring at ego. That's what's there. So you get to the point where you understand, okay, that's what everybody is. It's consciousness staring at ego. We all got different egos because we all had different experiences. So we built different self-concepts. If you had different experiences, you'd have a different ego. You'd have a different self-concept. That's all. Right? Especially the big experiences in your life. You have some bad experience, haven't you? What if you didn't have it? You'd be different. You'd think differently. You'd have different opinions. Maybe you'd change your political party. Everything is the sum of your learned experiences. So if you had different experiences, it's talking different. You're not different. You're the same consciousness watching it when it went through its changes, but you're not because you got lost in it. So that's what it is now. So how do you get out? First, can you get out? Yes. Can everybody get out? Yes. Yes. Can Putin get out? Yes. I wish he would. Vladimir, come over here. Sit down. Right there. See, it says reserve for you. <laughs> he could get out, right? But he can't, can he? Because the ego's so invested in me, my mind. And if you expand the personal ego into the society ego, it's not about me, it's about my country. It's still I, me, mine. It's just something else you did with your ego. The only thing other than ego is self. It's not another thing the ego is doing. You'll know it when you're pure consciousness watching it. You'll see how big it is. And you can't judge anybody because it's all the same. Everybody's caught in that. And it's all due to their past experiences. And they built all this. How do you get out? You start by seeing the scope. I hope this helps. You just see it. Don't think it's wrong. Don't be embarrassed. You should not be embarrassed by a single thought you have. Period. I don't care how raunchy it is. I don't care how selfish it is. Just look at it. Ego. That's ego being ego. That does not make you not spiritual. Nothing can make you not spiritual. Why? You are the spirit watching that stuff. And it's not easy to stomach, is it? See yourself saying bad things. I wish I wish he'd die. I wish he'd die. Oh my God, I can't stand him anymore. Well, okay, there you go. That's ego. That's not you. That's not you. You're the one who noticed that the ego said that. You can't get out by defining ego being different. That's not what out is. 
the only thing that's out is the consciousness that's noticing. So when you can accept so deeply that, okay, I don't have to be embarrassed about this thing. I don't have to own it. It's not me. It's the Skinner said it was the sum of your learned experiences. It's not my fault that some of my learned experiences. I didn't deal with them well, sure. I can do better. But the net result is I am the consciousness watching this thing called ego. And now you understand how big it is. And that's it. Now what do I do? You won't be able to do it all at once. What you do is you accept. You mean I do what it tells me to do? That's not what acceptance is. That's giving in. Acceptance is I am here and I don't have to leave being in the seat of self because the ego did something. The ego is saying, oh my God, what if my husband leaves me? I would be so hurt. Do you have any evidence he wants to leave you? No, but he might. Sally's husband left her. Okay, fine. That's ego. Can it say that? Because it's going to. That's part of ego. It has possessiveness and fears. And Look, how can it not? You just built this thing and said the whole world needs to be the way I want. Of course, it's going to be scared. It should be scared. Because <laughs> it's not going to be that way. But if you could sit in the consciousness and watch it do that and become and relax and not get lost in what it said, it will come and go. It will pass through. It is because you can't handle it that it doesn't leave, that it doesn't thin out. What you do when it says stuff like that, so what should I do? Oh my God, I'll dress different. I need to go and look different and look younger. I need to go buy a neat car that she'll be more interested in. And these are things other people tell you to do. I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm just telling you, it's ego. And you're going to have to do some along the way. You're not going to jump out of this all at once. But I'm here to teach you the bottom line. Then you just work your way with it. So basically, you look at it and you say, either you can handle that ego said that and feels that. I told you I'm going to do mine, but heart goes along, doesn't it? There's all kinds of emotions being generated there also. So now this combination of the mental and emotional, your psyche, can you handle it? Now, can you change it? Not can you make the world be the way you want so that it's not bothering your ego. Then you're serving your ego. All it does is reinforce. To me, and I'm going to be really, really bad, a drug addict, and I respect deeply that people get addicted to drugs. And a heroin addict is addicted to heroin. Tell him or her all you want. Just don't do it. It's ruining your life. It ain't going to happen. There's an addiction. You're addicted to your ego. You're addicted to your ego. That heroin addict will go out there and do everything they can They sell their bodies, they sell everything they have, they lie, they cheat, they steal, everything in order to get a hit. You do everything you can so your ego doesn't get bothered. That's scary, isn't it? They change how you talk, how you dress, they avoid people, you move, you move to another city because I, no one likes me here and I don't want to put up with it because if they had a bad newspaper article and you leave your jobs. You serve the ego because you can't handle how it can mess up, how it can feel. Or, okay, I love my job. I love what I'm doing. I love where I live. But I met this person. I met this person. It just, it feels so right. Everything. And you leave everything. I'm not telling you not to do it. Right? That's ego. It wants something. It doesn't want something. And when you give it what it wants, it feels great. And when it has what it doesn't want, it feels like, oh my God, it's terrible. And therefore, you devote yourself, just like an addict, you devote yourself to doing every single thing you can to have it feel good and not feel bad. I'm not telling you not to fall in love. I'm not telling you not to go run after feel. I'm not telling you anything. But boy, I want to lay it down right, okay? That ego is something else, isn't it? And it can mess you up serious. When it doesn't get what it wants, or it gets what it doesn't want, you're in trouble, aren't you? Just like a heroin addict. You can't handle it. I can't. I'm shaking. I can't. You shake. You do all kinds of stuff. Cry. So how do you get out? I told you, you can get out. You can get out. And out is just beautiful. Out is a state of absolute, total well-being. It's called unconditional well-being. Sure, there's love, but there's unconditional love. There's love beyond the ego. There's love beyond the ego getting what it wants. There's unconditional love, unconditional well-being, unconditional ecstasy and joy. And the funny part is not that there is. You are it. <laughs> That's what's so funny. You are it. But you're looking at something that isn't. And you built your house there. How do you get out? You start by seeing what we've taught tonight. You see ego. You see the scope of ego. Okay, don't freak. Quiet down. At least accept. There it is. Now accept the fact that if ego gets what it wants, it's going to get all blustery and exciting and you feel real good. All the chakras will open and all this energy will flow. Okay, accept that. That's right. That's right. That's going to happen, isn't it? 
It's starting to happen to you, hasn't it? And accept that if it gets what it doesn't want, that's going to feel really depressed and hurts and the heart hurts and gets rich. It feels like somebody's got their hand in there wringing everything out. Okay? That's ego. That's the power it has because you identified yourself with it. Okay? Can you little by little learn to live with that? I'm being much too honest tonight. Can you little by little learn to live with an ego? What do you mean? It does that, doesn't it? So if you can't accept that it does that, you will have to serve it so that it gets what it wants. See, it's not about renunciation. That's ridiculous. It's about acceptance. It's the opposite of renunciation. I accept that my ego is like that. And I'm just aware. I'm aware. I'm aware. That's all you do. It's called witness consciousness. I'm aware. Look, it got what it wanted. It doesn't have to be a big thing. It got what it wanted. Oh, look at the menu. It's what I wanted for lunch today. Oh, God, this is great. Good. Be happy. Don't renounce it, all right? Just see it. That's ego. That's ego. Then the same thing when something doesn't go the way you want. I didn't get the raise. I didn't get the raise. He got the raise. That's not fair. That's not fair. This is just, the world's not fair. It has nothing to do with fair or not fair. The starting position is, that's ego, isn't it? That's ego. Can I handle that without getting weird? It's the only word I can use. Can I handle that the ego is acting up? How's that? Acting up, <laughs> right? Like kids throwing a tantrum. The ego's acting up. Do I have to get weird? Or can I do the mantra? Can I breathe? Can I relax? Just to start with, I'm not saying you don't do anything about anything. I'm just saying you start by using everything as an opportunity to get a distance between self consciousness an object of consciousness. First relax. First relax. And you'll get some distance. Then look outside. Is there something I'm supposed to be doing? Maybe I need to join a woman's rights group that says men get paid more than women. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as you're not doing it for your ego. As long as you didn't get all hurt personally and I'm going to put up with this, I don't understand this kind of thing and you'll be some radical, crazy person. All right? You're just looking at it saying, this is not fair. It needs to be some changes and so on. I can work with that calmly, open. There's nothing wrong with working with the world to help change or bring about things, all right? There is something drastically wrong with being reactive and being unable to handle things, and that's why you're doing it. I'm doing it because I can't handle it. You see the difference? That's how you live with an ego. You live with it. It's like a handicap. How do you feel? I always talk about that somebody who's got a handicap, but they don't care. I, I love it. I'm, I'm so impressed. They're not hiding anything or doing anything. They just didn't identify with the thing, and they're perfectly fine. That's how you be with an ego. I got one. It's a problem. I'm handicapped by it, but I can live with it. I'm fine. I'm fine. I know it gets weird sometimes. It goes up, it goes down, it does all these stupid things, and I'm centered. That's what's called being centered. Don't try to make the ego centered. That's a whole other game. You be centered in the face of the ego. And what will happen is because you can handle it, you won't have to do what it says. And then you can see clearly above it. You can see above it. And you'll be able to make decisions from a higher level as opposed to the ego running your life. And little by little, because you don't have to do what it says, it's a habit like any other habit. Little by little, the drug addict can go through withdrawal. How's that? You need to go through withdrawal from the ego. The drug addict doesn't go and get rid of all heroin that exists in the universe before he gives up heroin. They have to go through the discomfort of the withdrawal of not having the drug. Well, you need to go through the discomfort of the withdrawal of learning to live with an ego without letting it run your life. And so you just little by little, little by little, not all at once, and don't judge. Don't judge. I should be higher than this. I shouldn't have been bothered by that. No, that's ego making a spiritual ego. Just relax. Just keep relaxing. Just keep relaxing in the face and give it a little kiss on the head. You can hug it. You won't want it to start with, but eventually you say, oh, come here. It's okay, but just see it as the ego and it will start to thin out. As you let it go, you could swore, you know, as guru said the following, an ignored guest quickly leaves. See, it took me an hour to talk about this. I could have said in one sentence, an ignored guest quickly leaves. If you don't pay attention to the fit that the ego's throwing, just like a kid throws a tantrum, don't hit it and don't give it what it wants. But what's the alternative? Relax. It's a kid. Relax is the nature of a three-year-old. You can deal with it. Do the best you can not to bother everybody else, but don't you get bothered. Relax. Same thing. Fine. You've got an ego. Relax. 
relax. It will fall away. It will fall away. And the next thing you know, it won't have the pull on you that it has now. And it will thin out. And then eventually it thins out enough to where it doesn't distract you. And next thing you know, you're feeling joy. That's their natural joy. Next thing you know, you're feeling bliss. Next thing you know, falling into meditation spontaneously without even trying. You're sitting watching TV and you're gone. That's how it should be. Your natural stage is the highest thing there is. All right. Very good. Work with yourselves. Jagger Diff.